Okay, so I'll do a week. I'll do a week. I'm going to one. On today's <laughs> podcast, we have a man who has stood this podcast up and turned us down more times than I care to mention. A man who's played for more clubs than you've had hot dinner. Simon, <laughs> man, Simon welcome to the podcast. How are you? How are you doing, mate? All good? Yeah, good to be here, finally. Yeah, eventually. Just, made just, it eventually. Just, stars have aligned. That's it, that's it, mate. Well, I want to get down to some of the rumours that swirl around you, Simon. So we've got a direct quote here. I just want you to respond to it. Girls don't like boys. Girls like Simon Murray. Simon, is this true? Uh, I don't even think my wife likes me. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to uh, deny like, that. Where does that chance good, uh, start? Good. What was the first yeah, place good. that started? Yeah, it was Hibs. Uh, I think it was, yeah, obviously the song, uh, Girls Like Cars and Money, Girls yeah. Like Simon Money. I think it just... I think it was just one of these ones that just fell into place as in it rhymed. Uh, the song went, the song, the song catched on. Uh, but yeah, so uh, I'm not sure uh, if they do like Simon Murray, but um, good song. Good, good song. song. It's only catch your number. I'm a, I'm a fan of it. I'm a fan of it. The reason I wanted you on the podcast was, well, obviously because you're a legend, Simon, but because you've had an unusual route to professional football. Um, obviously didn't do it really the conventional way so just take us through like obviously how we started teams you went to and how it kind of came about yeah um, well just sort of the first well the route obviously that your sort of normal professional footballer would be um, obviously get picked up by pro club go through the sort of maybe academy from maybe even the likes of 10 year old and obviously get that training all the way through. Um, like you see nowadays, obviously in the Dundee and Dundee United and our city have obviously the, the schools where the kids go to school. Um, they train maybe for two periods of their day. Uh, and then obviously as they progress on, they'll go full time and hopefully make a good career. But yeah, back obviously when I was a bit younger, we didn't have that for a start. And the academies, um, they weren't as good anyway. There wasn't probably as much, uh, I just suppose, I suppose spaces for kids and stuff like that. But yeah, anyway, I, w- I was with uh, Dundee United as a as a young young boy, uh, maybe up until thirteen, fourteen, maybe fifteen. Uh, but no, I was a bit younger. But yeah, so I kind of left that uh, to be honest, um, and just went through the, the sort of the junior ranks, um, uh, which. For all you that don't know, us uh, juniors in Scotland is pretty much men's football, but it's just uh, non-league football, uh, non-professional, semi-professional sort of level, uh, where obviously you just train twice a week and play the weekend. So started there. Um, my first sort of junior team uh, was Downfield Juniors. Um, so I had a good probably. Um, sort of learning curve there because I was obviously, I was sixteen at the time, seventeen, just playing against men, sort of week in week out from an early age, uh, competitive football as well, which was good. And then I went on to another junior team in the area, um, uh, under the manager John McGlashan at the time, um, Tayport. So that was good. Uh, we done done really well and. Yeah, kind of just took off from there and into the professional ranks. And um, our Broth was my first professional club. Mm. But obviously, you went to Australia first, or was that? Yeah. Before? And then you came back, and were, you took a year out, didn't you? And then you came. Yeah. Back. So, so, so what actually happened was when I was at Tayport, mm. I had a really good season. I scored like forty odd, uh, nearly fifty goals. Uh, in that age, I was like, I was twenty, twenty one. I was, tw- I was about 20, 21, and I actually thought to myself, like, I'm not at this, I'm not getting that break. Maybe, um, and I had people here, like my manager at the time, saying, Look, I'll get you, I'll get you, uh, like a, a chance to get a part time professional club in Scotland and then take it from there. And at the time, I had a little couple of niggles, like injury wise, and I thought to myself that I wanted to go out and just. You know, because I never at the time thought I could make a career out of professional football. 
um, and I just wanted to explore and, and go do a bit of traveling. And I thought it was just a good time to do it. I just finished um, my plumbing uh, apprenticeship that I was doing with my family at the time. So I thought I finished that, I've got a bit of savings, just wanted to go around, travel, do a bit of, around Asia, I've done a bit and then went, ended up going to Australia. Um, so that was obviously a great experience to me. But um, yeah, I didn't at the time then. Obviously, when I come back a year later, that's when I done four months at another junior club in Dundee just to get some games and some some matches in in me, and then I got my opportunity in that summer uh, where I went on trial at Arbroath and I got a, a contract. So when you came back from Australia, was there was there still no kind of thought of like I can make this professional? Was it still just kind of you wanted to play junior on that? When did you think I can actually have a go at this? Like maybe I could go pro. I knew obviously at that level that I was playing at that I was probably doing really well at that that level of the top junior leagues in right. Northern Scotland and I thought well the next stage for me obviously is the the professional league but when I suppose when you're playing in that the junior you, you you probably have that thought of oh am I good enough for that next level and then when you go there and you, you actually see it pretty much the same or similar level and they maybe just do things that are more professional, maybe they've been in the professional ranks and they live their life a bit better or whatever, or it's old pros that have dropped down. There's loads of different uh, things, but yeah, it was probably, well, my manager at the time, John McGlashan, a family friend, sadly, he's he's, he's passed away, um, but he always would phone me when I was in Australia and message saying, look, you're ready to come back and stop being stupid, get back, sure. get back here and like try and try and give the professional like their best shot and uh yeah as he would say he was he was right to come back and you know like focus fully on the, on my football. So going from the same pro to the pro was is the biggest difference just the professionalism or is it fitness or, or is it like you said t- technically there isn't actually too much difference there so is it just a professionalism thing then? Yeah, was it well? If you look at like, for instance, junior players that I'd played, but technically, or ability-wise, there could be amazing players out there. They've just not filled their p- potential uh, by obviously living their life right or doing the gym, the gym work that we all know now is is obviously very important. But that comes with education as well. Maybe when they went when back and. The days that we were coming through, we never really got told any of the stuff that all the, the young guys are getting. So it's all about knowing like what to do and and how to live your life, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and then it, for whatever reason, players, you know, they don't make a career out for whatever. There could be things in their life or they, they choose maybe, you know, going out with your friends obviously is a big part of losing out on a career or, or other things or whatever like that. But um, I think the big, the next step up, it was just probably more of a collective. Whereas the junior was maybe three or four guys in the team that were were good, it was maybe in the next step up, it was ten and twelve guys that were better. And then as you go, the competition and 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 the quality around the whole league or the whole squad just gets better and better and better. Um, but yeah, as you say, they, they probably have the knowledge of being that professional, disciplined, eating right not drinking maybe at the weekends and uh, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And obviously our bro went pretty well for you and were you able from there to Dundee United, was it? Yeah, so I actually signed like a one year contract at our Um I remember going up on a Tuesday night. It was I was still actually with a junior team, but our bro wanted to have a look at me. And I went up, it was like Perth High School uh I had a really a, like unbelievable training session and the manager phoned me the next day, he says, look, where are you? I want to come and sign you. Can I meet you at McDonald's, of all places on in Dundee? I said, look, I'll, I'll be there. I just At that time, I'm desperate to get an opportunity to get my sort of name out there or just to give it the best go. I wasn't thinking about, it's, even at this point, full-time football was just well like above where I thought I could. I wasn't even aiming at that point. I, I never had no goals, really. It was just like, right, get, get in it there. I wasn't thinking too far ahead, which probably looking back was maybe a good thing. 
because yeah. they didn't have no pressure on me. I, I, just, I was just kind of thinking, right, the next step, get up low, score goals, like just enjoy it because even at the part time level, like players are still making some decent money along with their own job. That it pays to still play at that level. So, um, anyway, I signed. I wasn't caring about the salary, like the money and stuff, uh, because it just wasn't in my. So I just wanted the opportunity. So, yeah, I ended up signing at Arbroath and I had an amazing uh, first six months. I'd scored like 20 goals up till, to Christmas. The team was doing, doing amazing and uh, I was like fortunate enough that Dundee United uh, were interested in. Uh, I basically just went straight for it, straight for it. Right, then you got going back right. to Arbroath and obviously... And then you move to Dundee United. Now you're on the rare position of being a Dundee and a Dundee United player. Looking back, would you have went to United or like obviously you get some stick for it nowadays nowadays. So do you have any regrets about playing for both parts of the city or anything like that? No, like absolute complete opposite, I think. Right. That's an amazing, amazing thing to be proud of. Um growing up as as it's been said or whatever, I was I was a Dundee fan, I had a season ticket, but uh, when you play football, kind of supporting a team kind of goes out the, it goes out the window, do you know what I mean? I, I, to me, Dundee United though, was an amazing part of my life because that was getting a phone call from the manager at the time, Jackie McNamara, saying, look, we're interested. To me, that was like the, the best, probably the best, one of the best days before my kids or my family, the one of the best days of of my life because it was like I'm I'm working on building sites and I'm training on Tuesday and Thursday nights and I get this phone call and my life's changed overnight. I'm going to live the dream that every every kid has always wanted that all basically grow up their whole life wanting to do and I got that opportunity through Dundee United. So for me to sit and say that I wasn't proud or regret that would be absolutely stupid so and they're one of the biggest clubs in the country so it's ultimately <coughs> something that uh, I'll be proud of for the rest of my life oh, yeah. love it Simon love it so then obviously Hibs as well you went to play at Hibs and I know you, had a, you loved Hibs didn't you? you had a great time at Hibs they've got a brilliant training facility you scored some worldies at Hibs and stuff like that <laughs> and then yeah you... some nice ones yes, yeah. <laughs> and then South Africa you went off to South Africa. So I want to, you've told me some stories in the past about South Africa. So let everyone know about like the kind of culture shocks there are in South Africa, like maybe the witch doctors and all this kind of stuff. Because it seems like, well, one, would you ever think to yourself that you'd end up in South Africa playing football on a good wage? That sounds insane. Yeah, I mean, that's totally, it was like total curveball in my sort of career path. Uh, as you just spoke about the sort of junior Junior leagues, lower leagues, professional, full time, Dundee United Tibbs. And then obviously, all just normally what the path would maybe be an our Scottish team or yeah. maybe try England or whatever else. But the opportunity just came abroad. Uh, I wanted to kind of play abroad wherever that may be. And this opportunity just came across at this time. Uh, and I met the club and the officials from obviously Bidvest, who I went to. and they just explained what they were like, and I, I never stepped foot obviously uh, in South Africa before. Uh, like I'd already signed basically, and I'd, I'd, I hadn't even seen the city, the country, so I was just going off of what the guys were telling me. Yeah, so um, ultimately, it turned out to be like one hell of like amazing experience, like loads of stuff happening, and yeah, brilliant part of brilliant part of my career that. I learned a lot from these guys, the way that they live and how they were brought up. Uh, that makes you appreciate a lot of stuff that you have in, in your life. Yeah, I bet, mate. I bet. But I wasn't f too far into that kind of move where you done your ACL, yeah. So obviously that's a huge, huge injury, and it's probably it's the worst injury you can do in kind of performance, uh, kind of sports and stuff like that. Um, did you realize when you'd done it? Did you realise, like, what you'd done? And did you realise, like, how long the road to recovery would be and kind of how hard it would be? Or did you kind of see it just for another injury? You know, like... Yeah, to be honest, like, I'm quite a positive sort of person in that 
Um, I think you've got to be just keep going and whatever else. Obviously, have my moments just like everyone else. But at the time in the game, I knew it was a bad sort of collision slash tackle twist. Uh, it wasn't anything horrendous. It was sore at the time. And then I was on a holding my leg sort of thing for maybe a couple of minutes while I took the it was more of like a collision as if you'd run into somebody full force and looking back I think it, there was a little sort of crunch sort of thing but uh, as I say I got up and I ended up playing on for a couple of minutes until I got the ball again and turned inside and I basically just fell over right. uh, my, my leg sort of just totally gave way Um and then, to be honest, my physio done all sort of the tests that you could do pitch side, but um, didn't really want to say, uh, yeah. I think, for sure, until the scan was done. So got scanned and all that, but within a couple of days, I had the results, obviously, of ruptured ACL, torn, snapped meniscus, uh, you name it, I had it. Um, but at the time, I was just, it was kind of just like the physio, this is it. You like, you can't, you can't feel sorry for yourself. You just got to get on with it. This is your part of your job, part of the stuff that comes along with it. You can mope and sort of feel sorry for yourself, but at the end of the day, that's ultimately not going to get you anywhere. Um, so you just need to get on with it and make, make, make sure you come back as as best as what you can. You're right, and and you've got to look at the positives, and the positive is through that you met me. So oh well, yeah, cloud. unbelievable. <laughs> and here we are here we are but yeah I remember getting the call from you and I remember you saying that you wanted to come in I think we were doing what we're doing twice a day like for a bit weren't we for like five days a week or something yeah we're doing twice ten o'clock four o'clock like we every. had a every day for I think it was like a good two two months it was full on two three months I can't, can't remember but like, oh, I think that was basically just what I needed mentally, physically. Obviously, I needed that uh, to get in because we were doing a lot of not just work on the knee, just sort of other stuff as yeah. well, just all around sort of stuff. There, eh? um, and that's yeah. I just needed to be focused on, like, basically getting back. And obviously, we worked hard. So, you want me to say thanks to you or something? Yeah. No, what was basically was um like obviously you can see you're determined at that point and your your dedication because like most people who do these injuries like when did you how long were you were you out for a year before you got back to playing football and kicking a ball was it ten months well yeah so it was it was a wee bit longer uh because obviously I'd I'd been abroad and. There was a whole sort of disruption with COVID. Um, and I remember I had to get the other little knee operation. I had a, a sort of, my leg pretty much wasn't getting full range of, of motion. Um, so I needed to get, a, there was a little sort of tissue in the back of the knee that was stopping it from going to full range. So I had to get a little keyhole surgery uh, yeah. to try and free it up again. So probably by the time we got back, it was about 14, 15 months. And then like, um, maybe 14, yeah. You compare that to obviously other players who are doing their ACL, maybe they'll get back in 12 months. I, mean, I think Van Dyke did it in maybe 10 months or something like that. But you've got to remember, they've got a full team behind them, literally. Like you were doing it by yourself, with me, but out of your own pocket as well. Like, And they have the best of their best equipment. And we were just working in a, a shithole of a gym, no offence to the gym, but it was a shithole at the time, uh, in the middle of Dundee. So I think kudos. Yeah, just on that. Yeah, what? thanks, mate. <clears throat> what, just, what? just just, just, on that, yeah, obviously. Um, everyone's different, you know, but at the same time, I think the, do the doctors <clears throat> and the surgeons, they'll tell you, oh, you could be back in a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could be back in a year, but they won't tell you that actually takes another year on top of that to get back to anywhere near the, where you are. So, yeah. yeah, you might come back on the pitch in a year. You might be playing games, but you won't be the same fitness-wise. You like If you think about it, if you're playing games week in, week out, training for years, and you get to a level, and then you take a year out, you're going to lose lots like of sharpness, like 
fitness, the whole game, like getting up to game speed. So it, it took me another year on top of that to get even anywhere near what I felt like I could do physically. Do you remember, because remember you saying that to me, like, I'm back, but I'm not really back yet. Um, do you remember the game where you felt, oh, I'm, I am back, I'm back to 100%, or do you remember what club were you at at that stage? Yeah, it was probably, like, when I was at Queen's Park, um, I joined them, and I was obviously doing re the, my sort of rehabilitation with you when I came back, but I'd done a little bit of, i done a bit with them as well, and then they'd done my pitch rehab. So then I've come back to that, and you you know when you do an injury like on the knee, you you probably focus that much on the knee that when you come back and you get playing, other little niggles start to occur, whether it may be your Achilles, because uh, you've not had any load through it, so you start getting tendonitis, or you get all these VR aches and pains, and it's on maybe your lower back because you've not been running on hard pitches. So, yeah. like, one thing's fine, but then it spirals out into three, four different things, and then you try and work on them. So I remember it was like, I actually had basically, the next full season at Queen's Park was kind of injury. I was had wee hammy niggles, some wee things. It probably wasn't until last season there, when I had a full first pre-season um, yeah. last year when I went to Holland with Queen's Park, had the full pre-season, played like six pre-season games, 80, 90 minutes, every one. And I got like a full pre-season under my belt that I probably felt like that's me back to training the way I can train. And now I'm feeling like probably even like I'm getting to the point now where I'm feeling like I could try and hit the heights that I know I could do. Yeah, you're, you're, in your, you're in your peak of your career now, mate. And obviously in that peak, you're now at a new club. You're at Ross County um, in the Prem. How has that been for you in terms of like the intensity? What's the difference there between the Championship where you're at Queen's Park and, and the Prem? Is it, is it just much faster pace or what is it? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's just the quality. The quality... Mm. Um, there's loads of different aspects I mean the pace of the game in the Scottish Championship is really fast to play a lot of maybe longer balls and channel balls and whatever else and it's you know the pitches maybe aren't as good when we get to the winter stages so there's less it's more of everyone's grafting it's a lot of honest players and stuff SPL is similar to that but um, a lot of this if you give the ball away if this if this the team maybe in the championship has five, six shots, they'll score one. But in the SPL, if they had two or three, they'll, you know, they'll punish you. Uh, and it's just, yeah, it's fine, finer margins. Um, yeah. Obviously, the higher level that you go. But ultimately, that's the aim of any player to try and get to the highest level that they can and challenge yourself every week. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, there's good players in the championship. As I said about the juniors, maybe three or four that could take the step up and then you go in this, this 10 all round. It's the same here. If you maybe three or five or six in my chat, the Queen's Park team that could take the step up, but when they get there, there's maybe an all all round bunch in yeah. the in the team, the all round quality of the team is better. Yeah, I know what you mean, man. So what is the goal now that you're doing your first season back in the Prem full season, what's the goal for this season and beyond? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't. I mean, in terms of personal goals, obviously, as a striker, you'll set sort of goal goal targets and whatever else. So, I would think if you could get to ten league goals, that would be good. And then you tick that off, and then you go maybe for fifteen, and then or just take little steps at a time. I think instead of looking right, oh, I want to score twenty goals this season, and it's a target that's almost seems too far away that you keep on trying things maybe that you wouldn't try. So, yeah, maybe just try for five and then 10 and then the 15, set little targets. Um, hopefully that way that then you're not looking too far and sort of worrying yourself or putting too much pressure on yourself. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, just keeping fit, keeping training the way I'm doing, look after, looking after myself the way I am and hopefully I hope the team and myself have a, have a good year. Sorry. Sorry. I've got uh, notifications and we've only got 10 minutes left, so we might have to 
exit and come back on, but we've not got much longer left, so we're all right. No worries, mate. I can't afford to pay for um, Zoom Premium. It's very expensive. Yeah, I wouldn't be either. Not enough for you, fuck's sake. Fuck that. <laughs> no, but I like the idea of breaking up your goals into small, manageable chunks. They always say to do that, otherwise, yeah, it gets, it's too daunting almost. Like saying you're going to score fucking 25 goals in a season, you've not even scored one yet, you're like fucking hell. And then you start trying to have and shit. So breaking up these small goals is, is always probably a good idea. What other tips would you give to, I like like asking you guys, established professionals, what tips you would give for aspiring footballers, I suppose, in your position, uh, maybe are 16, maybe they're in the academy or maybe have just been released to the academy. What's your tips for them? Um, well, I mean, if you're in the academy, for instance, it's, about taking the opportunity that you've got and not thinking because you're in the academy that one day you you'll just be a you'll just become a professional football. When you're in there, and you're you're in the eyes of the coaches and you're in the setup. Make sure you're doing all your working the hardest you can, showing sort of good attitude to stay there because it's hard getting into the professional game. It's even harder to actually stay there for 10 or 15 years. Right. Um, that's the hard part. Like anybody, or not saying anybody, but you see guys that coming up for one or two and then they do, they just fall away, mm-hmm. you know? So it's harder staying there. So just keep that attitude, train every day, show good enthusiasm. Um, application is obviously a massive thing. And the ability, the ability part will take care of itself. Obviously that's, Key, you want to be a great, you want to be a good footballer and pass pass the ball perfectly, score goals, do whatever. But ultimately, the, the sort of the key, most important things are how you handle yourself, how you work, I think how you train. We've talked about this before. I think you mentioned this to me. You can be a footballer in Scotland, especially, and just have good physical attributes. So, a good mental attributes, like. You're exceptionally fast. You work exceptionally hard. And you've got a brilliant like mindset on you, right? And a lot of people are nowhere near as technically good as you. But as long as you've got that aspect of it, you can make it. Maybe not to the level you have, but certainly make it to a semi-pro team, to a pro team, and make quite a good living off it as well. But it's that. It's more about the application and actually applying yourself and not thinking you've made it and going out at the weekends every weekend and stuff. We we both know, and you'll know more than me, countless people who are so talented but have not made it, and it's 99%. Well, a lot of times it might be due to, due to injuries, but the other half of that is due to fucking just their mindset and the way they are. Maybe they're immature or whatever. So I, I completely agree with you, mate. Yeah, I think on that it's just... Um... I was lucky when I went into Dundee United. I'd obviously not been a professional ever before, mm, so yeah. I never knew how to live as a professional, eat or sleep or sort of going out or whatever, like just living my life. So just I was lucky that I was able to watch older professionals mm. and take maybe examples from them over the sort of time that I played and whatever else. So just learning off of others and looking at how maybe the top guys do it and as you say, I've played with boys that are miles better, miles better than me, like from when I was young, and for whatever reason, they've never made it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll that's what I was saying. So, I think if you just stick to the the sort of main important things in terms of the working hard and looking after yourself and the, the sort of professionalism, that will stand you in good stead to at least make the best of what you can make the most of your ability. Yeah, I think you're 100% right, mate. I, we, we briefly talked before the start about, obviously, the Delhi Alley kind of interview, and obviously, I'm sure a lot of people listening have, have seen that now. Um, obviously, footballers nowadays are under a lot of kind of stress, scrutiny, especially from social media and media. How do you kind of deal with that? Do you make sure that you're having time away from your phone, making sure you're not searching Simon Murray on Twitter? What is it you do? Yeah, I mean, that's obviously... He'll be at the top end scale of, I mean, if he scores a goal or something good happens, there'll be 100,000 tweets or messages and it'll just be all over the place. But on the 
flip side of that when something bad happens or negative, uh, so the tabloids are after them or trying to spin photos or whatever, the same will occur. And normally when there's bad stuff getting put out there, it's always there always seems to be more, always highlights. It's always getting highlighted more than sort of positive. It's just mm. the way that humans seem to be. But yeah, probably when obviously it was something that I never even ever thought of, but when I went from juniors, there was nothing like that. To when I went to Arbroath, there was maybe a couple of thousand fans at the games. It would maybe be 40 or 30 tweets. Then you go to Dundee United and there's 15,000 at these games. And, you know, there's hundreds. And you're yeah. starting to think, oh, so when I was like 22, 23, I did struggle with like, oh, when I went out, everyone was like looking at me or, or not like that, but just like, okay. like what, could, like, because you just have to act differently and like, people will come up to you, which is good. Obviously, you want to speak about football and stuff, but it's quite hard at times when people just, you go to the shop or somebody's just thought, like, yeah, if you've had a bad game or something like that. So, I mean, obviously he was at the top end of the scale, world, world known footballer. But, I mean, even at our level, we do see it in the, the social media, you know, if there's a story to be had, you know, some deal and somebody's making money out of it they'll ultimately try try their best luckily I've been a good boy and not been in the paper for any bad things but I mean still just the pressure of the social media on Twitter and all that if you have a shit game which okay. trust me it's, it's happened um, I don't believe it <laughs> but, okay, thank you uh, but yeah look that happens it's just something probably that you deal with mm. but like it's one of these industries that it just happens. Like if you had a bad day at your your work, I wouldn't come and say, Oh, that session, don't go there, that session was pish. <laughs> I might do it. Might do it. Might do it. Might yeah. do it. Next time. Get my money right. back. Let's get <laughs> let's give we've got two minutes left, so we're gonna do some quick fire questions for you. I like these. Favorite goal you've scored? Oh, uh Hibs Hearts Derby. He's got me, hundred uh, percent. Favorite team? Um, Man United. <laughs> Brilliant. Very diplomatic of you there. Uh, biggest Slash Ross County. <laughs> biggest animal you could beat up? Oh, uh, hamster. Hamster. <laughs> That's a toss up. That. <laughs> um, I've asked my last. Uh, Guess this, and they didn't know. But favorite or what a celebrity you would like to fight? Is there any celebrities you want mad beef with? Uh, not really, actually. No. no okay. uh, oh yeah, actually, the beard you. <laughs> okay, I'll make that happen for you. <laughs> right, okay, is that because he beat your sprint speed on that? In, in no, that... he never thought, did he? <laughs> <laughs> if you could play any other sport in the world, what would it be? Oh, golf. Golf. Professional. Yeah, yeah, golf. Legal. Yeah, but not obviously to the not well. <laughs> yeah, averagely. Averagely. Right, Simon. Thank you very much for that. That was superb, mate. Make sure we're all following Simon and make sure we give him pelters if he misses any absolute setters. Okay. I'm sure that'll happen. <laughs> 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 Cheers, mate. Thank you. Cheers.